When it comes to health and wellness, good sleep is essential. Ashley invites you to a new era of sleep with the latest in sleep technologies. Experience all-night cooling with the Tempur-Pedic Breeze Collection or rest easy with adaptive pressure relief on the all-new Purple Collection thanks to its Gel Flex Grid. Don't lose sleep over choosing a new mattress. Your perfect fit is here at Ashley. Shop online or visit an Ashley store today. Better sleep starts here. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man with a reminder that if you are listening in the car or truck to drive the True Crime Garage way, which is to say, friendly, here is the captain. Wave to your neighbors. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are very happy to be featuring Hatchback Inferno by our good Southern friends down at Tactical Brewing Company. Hatchback Inferno is an ESB with smoked hops. ESB stands for Extra Special Bitter, a style known for its balance and interplay between malt and hop bitterness. So a very interesting and unique beer and flavor. Garage grade three and three quarter bottle caps out of five. And here's some unique and interesting people that helped us fill up the fridge this week here in the old garage. Let's give a praise and thank you to all of those who helped. First up, a cheers to Stephanie from Dexter, Michigan. And a big We Like Your Jib goes to Gina from NYC. And last but certainly not least, we have Patty Bordellen in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Everyone we just mentioned, they went to our website, truecrimegarage.com, clicked on the pint glass, and that helped us out with this week's shows. And for that, we thank you. Yeah, B-W-E-W-R-U-N, Beer Run. If you need more True Crime Garage for your earballs, check out our bonus content. You can find it in the website store, or you can find it through the Apple Podcast app. And, Colonel, that's enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. The True Crime Podcast Buffet. You can click, swipe, and search and find yourself staring at your listening device, mesmerized by the True Crime Podcast Buffet. There are so many to choose from. Back when True Crime Garage first started in 2015, there were only about a dozen, maybe two dozen of these shows. Mostly mom and pop type operations, and we were excited to join the ranks. Then, in 2017, it was like the levee broke, and everyone and their cousin had a true crime podcast. Around this same time, the big boys started moving in. The big networks came to true crime podcasting. This dramatically changed the space. It created a landscape where the smaller operations, had difficulty thriving, and so many of them would give up or slow down the frequency of their shows. Some have said the networks were there to choke out the little guys. Well, True Crime Garage ain't tapping out, and we are still an independent podcast. In 2018, I read an article titled 
what makes a good true crime podcast? I thought, wow, it looks like someone has finally put together a tried and true recipe for a good true crime podcast. The article said that, of course, you have to have mystery and intrigue. The podcast should have a likable and relatable victim or victims. The counter to that is that the recipe also called for unlikable villains and suspects that are either weird, mysterious, or both. A good true crime podcast needs to have several shades of gray across the backstory, the crime itself, and the key players involved. Then, add a pinch of corruption, several spoonfuls of lies and deceit, a healthy side of a conspiracy that complements the entree, and the icing on the cake and the cherry on top, a cover-up. Well, that was the gist of the article, but I created all the food references. I finished the article and thought how confused the author or the team of writers were with this lame attempt at some powerful piece of do-it-yourself podcasting advice, a magazine that at the time had not produced a single true crime podcast. Where they had got it completely wrong was scattered throughout the entirety of the article, but it started right at the top, right at the title. What makes a good true crime podcast? Now, we've been doing this long enough that we could spend an entire evening discussing ways to make a good true crime podcast. There are many out there doing it well and doing it in different ways. But the number one way to have a good podcast is to have a good case. The details of the true crime story cannot be manufactured. They are either there or they are not there. It is not about creating the perfect recipe for the true crime story that you are telling. It's about the presentation and how it is delivered to your table. This week, we bring to your table a true crime story that has all of the ingredients for a good true crime story and none of it manufactured. We have a likable, relatable victim, 17-year-old Molly Miller, the good girl, who was loved by all, good at sports, and very close to her siblings, who grew to be a wayward teen. She started to get into trouble. She had lessons to learn, but her whole life ahead of her. Our story has the unlikable villain, 21-year-old James Con Nip, a privileged young man who stole cars, broke the law frequently, and thumbed his nose at authority just because he could. This story has strange suspects, several of them sent off for jail time or prison stints. Who had a hand in the crimes committed or who didn't have a hand in the crimes? There are many theories of what actually happened in our case this week. They can't all be true. We have lies and deceit from the suspects, from the suspects' families, and even from members of law enforcement who were sworn to protect and serve. As for Shades of Grey, one of the victims, very little is known about his backstory. There is even speculation on how the parties involved knew each other and why they would spend time with one another at all. Friends who were obvious enemies and enemies pretending to be friends. An area that was and very well could still be rife with drug activity. A sheriff with family ties to the case. A law enforcement agency that many wonder, did they look the other way on this? Did they do a thorough investigation? Did one of their own have any involvement? A family searching for answers and justice. And a lot of talk across two counties about corruption and a possible cover-up. Oh yeah, and this true crime story has a high-speed car chase as well. We will address each and every one of those topics in this week's telling of our true crime story. This is the case of Molly Miller and Colt Haynes, and this is True Crime Garage.
Wilson, Oklahoma is a town in Carter County with a population of about 1,700 people. Love County is just south of Carter County. So Love County is right on the Texas-Oklahoma state borders. Both are in the heart of Chickasaw Country and Tornado Alley. It was home to the Chickasaw Nation. Then this area sadly became a hot spot for drugs, mainly methamphetamine. Back in 2013, where we pick up this story, we have 17-year-old Molly Miller. She was born in April of 1996. At this time, she's living with her mother and grandparents. Molly was described as a fun-loving kid who was very outgoing and a talented athlete. She played and excelled at softball. She was the light of life to her grandfather, Alex. I spoke with someone who worked on this case, and they said Alex was a great, sweet family man. And everyone suspected that Molly was Alex's favorite grandchild. He loved to show off her softball trophies. Molly was rebellious, feisty, and had a reputation for speaking her mind. And as we all know, this sometimes can get one into trouble. Our story is going to pick up in the summertime. And I've seen several reports, some stating that Molly would be starting her junior year of high school in the fall but others saying that she had just completed her junior year. When I spoke with people close to the case, this, as everyone will see, is an insignificant detail, so it was not on my list of questions. Now, let's jump back to late 2012, just for a second, and talk about Molly's cousin, Paula Fielder. Paula is grown with at least one adult child of her own, a son that is in his late 20s at this time. Paula and Molly's mother, who were and remain close, they were actually talking about having Molly move in with the cousin, Paula, because she was starting to get into some trouble and she was hanging out with the wrong crowd. Paula lived about two and a half hours away. Now, things between Molly and her mother must have gotten better because nothing ever came of this arrangement. Molly never moved in with Paula. All right, let's go back to 2013. Yeah, let's go to after the school year. So this is June 28th, 2013. On this day, 17-year-old Molly Miller gets into an argument with her mother, Melissa, during which Molly storms out of the house. So she goes and decides to stay with a close friend. This is not the first time that this has happened. She would usually be gone for a day or two and then return home, but this time something was different. Some say the big difference this time was that she had met someone. His name is Colt Haynes, and by all accounts, Molly had a near instant crush on him. Colt Haynes was an older boy. He was 21 years old, a good-looking young man that Molly did not know prior to leaving her mother's home in late June. Now, we need to point something out here, Captain, about this area of Oklahoma. This true crime story takes place in Carter County and Love County. Love County is described as a place where everyone knows everyone. Now, I know we hear that a lot about these more rural areas, but in this case, everyone knows everyone is an understatement. This was proven to me a dozen times when looking into this case. In Love County, everyone knows everyone, and they know your mom, your dad, your brother, your cousins. Everybody knows everybody. I know a lot of moms. In Carter County, it's a little more populous. Love County is just 10,000 people. Carter County is about 48,000 people. So in Carter, most people know each other. But it's more of a two degrees of separation situation in Carter County. So we have Molly that is 17 and she has a crush on Colt, which is 21 years old. That's correct. And the two would spend some time together in the coming days, but it's unclear what Colt's feelings were for Molly. We don't have anyone saying that he was pursuing her or wanted a relationship with her. But in this time away from her mother's house, Molly, through friends, found herself in the same social circles as Colt Haynes. 
Colt was considered by most to be a good young man. He was a pretty good student, not a great student, but a pretty good student. In high school and after, he had a ton of friends, but he, like many in this area at the time, unfortunately for decades actually, he slipped into drug use. Meth, as we said, is a huge problem in this area. It has been for those decades. In fact, it was described to me by a local as back then, meaning in the early 2000s and 2010s, as it was like a freight train of meth was making regular stops in Love and Carter counties. Colt had an on-again, off-again drug problem. He'd get clean for a while, and then he'd fall back into it. And unfortunately, this is something that we would see with other people as well in this area because of the amount of drugs and the amount of drug use in this area, it's almost easier to slip back into drugs than to stay away from it altogether. When you have this addiction, it's sad. It's something that's tough to beat and you're in an area where you can't really escape it. Now, Molly leading up to this summer it was reported that she had already started to dabble with meth and some of her close family and friends were concerned about this. In fact, this is likely what was causing problems at home during that school year. Again, addiction is tough. It's sad. It's something that anyone can easily fall into. Sometimes it only takes one time use to find yourself on the other side of the tracks. So some of the rumors, some of the thoughts is that Molly was hiding her relationship with Colt, but it, that's kind of confusing to me. And I, I think to you as well, Colonel, because they weren't seeing each other that long. So it c- could be that she just wasn't telling people about a new relationship. And as we said, we don't know if she was intending to go home. So not sharing this relationship, if it even was one with her family, wouldn't surprise me if she didn't have any immediate intentions of returning home. She's probably not sharing a lot of things with home and her family at that time. And they, by all accounts, only knew each other for about a week to maybe 10 days at the very most leading up to the events of our mystery. Now, some have speculated as to why she would hide this if she was even hiding it at all. But the speculation captain is one Colt is older. You know, he's an adult. She is not. So that's obvious Two, He has a baby with another woman and three, he had a reputation for getting in trouble with the law. But I want to be clear about this. You can be a good guy and get in trouble with the law. We have a person who is struggling with addiction And everything that I could find as far as trouble with the law came about because of drugs. It's all drug related charges. We're not talking about a violent person, right? We're not talking about somebody that is stealing and robbing others or terrorizing others or harming others. He unfortunately has this drug problem and it's led him to other issues. Yeah. Which is causing him to hurt himself and, And all these crimes are really, again, like you said, crimes that are against himself. As we said, Molly and Colt only knew each other for about a week or so. Now, here is what we know about their time together. On July 5th, Molly and Colt, it's later determined that this was Molly and Colt caught on camera. But Molly, Colt, and two others are caught on surveillance video camera at the Wilson Casino parking lot. This was an apparent drug deal going on, but no one was arrested. No one is charged. This was not a police situation. Now, note the date, though, Captain. That's July 5th. Remember, we know that Molly left her mother's house on June 28th. So we're only about seven days after she leaves her mother's house. The following day, on July 6th, two unnamed people went to a home and picked up Molly and Colt, and they all went to another house together and hung out together for some period of time. So we know Molly and Colt were together again on this day, on July 6th. Now, here's where things get incredibly strange. Sunday, July 7th, 2013, 
Molly is trying to get her friend Jessica. And from everything I could find, these two are really tight. Jessica's her best friend. So she's trying to get Jessica, who she was staying with after leaving her mother's house, to go to a party with her. But Jessica is refusing to go. There's people there and probably a drug element there that she's not interested in being involved with. In fact, she's trying to help her friend out, saying, Molly, I don't want to go. I'm refusing to go. You shouldn't go to this party either. Molly decides to go. She wants to go to this party anyway, and it's my belief and many others' belief that she knew that Colt would be there, and that's likely why she wanted to attend. Yeah, and party is kind of a loose term. I mean, these are more like small gatherings, but... It- but we think they're called parties to these individuals because there's going to be drug use or or alcohol use or, or something because it's only a handful of people hanging out. Exactly. All teenagers and people that have lived through their early 20s, they know that oftentimes some people are calling something a party. You show up, there's five people there. <laughs> and it's just it's just friends hanging out, really having a good time together. That is what this appears to be. They called it a party. There was only a few people at this location. At some point during this night, this is a Sunday, Molly and Colt decide to get into a vehicle with a guy who is known by the name of Con. So who is Con? Con is James Con Nip. He's age 21. And he knows Colt. He knows Molly. But... He and Colt don't really like each other. And apparently he and Molly have known each other for a very long time. So James Con Nip is a spoiled young brat. That's the best way to describe this dude. All right. He lives with his grandparents who live in Love County. This is about 30 minutes away from where Molly was staying. He lives on a what's referred to as a compound deep in the woods surrounded by many, many acres of land. I had a hard time figuring out how just how many acres, as it's reported to be anywhere from right around 100 to some people saying that it's like 1,000 acres of land. So very hard to determine how large this property is, but we know that he lives at this home with grandparents and it also sounds like the home and the property is large enough that there are other members of this family that live on this very large property now the nip family is well known throughout the entire county of love county and they are known because they they've had some success And not only that, but their family has ties there. They've been there for generation after generation after generation. Now, Khan, as he's known as, had a reputation for getting into trouble. This is much different than what we talked about with Colt Haynes, Captain. Khan, yes, he has drug use and a history of that, and we will see that in his, from the court records we have. But he also gets into trouble because he's just an asshole. Like he, he enjoys causing havoc and he seems to always get away with the, the things that he's creating. He never, there never seems to be much in the way of consequences for James con nip. So as far as his police record goes leading up to 2013, captain in 2010 and 2011 court records state that, Khan has a history of criminal charges and drug abuse. He had been convicted of possessing uh, possession of marijuana and drug paraphernalia in a 2010 case and convicted of driving under the influence of drugs in 2011. Now, as we said, everyone in town, everyone in the county, they know the nips. Molly is, in fact, a distant cousin of the nip family. And has known Khan for the majority of her life, or at least known his family. Right, so that's her connection to him. Exactly. As we said, Khan and Colt don't really get along. 
There's a lot of speculation as to why these two wouldn't have got along. We, we pointed out they're the same age. They're both 21. But one of the reasons may be that Khan at one point dated a former girlfriend of Colt's. And in fact, that is the woman that he had a baby with. And it's well known that Khan was very abusive to this young woman or this girl. She may have been a girl at the time of their relationship uh, because they dated around two, maybe even three years prior to the events that we're talking about here today. Well, and like you said, he's known to like being an asshole. Yes, very much so. So this girl, this woman leaves Khan and then starts dating Colt. I can't say for 100% certainty that that's why these two don't like each other. It could be a, it's likely a multitude of reasons. I'm guessing Katie Savage is this woman's name and the baby that her and Colt had together is named Jagger Haynes. He was only 10 months old at the time of our story. Katie said, and this is one big mystery piece within all the other mysteries that come with it in this story, Captain. We said that Colt and Molly, they get into a vehicle with Khan. Why the hell would Colt get into a vehicle with a guy that he does not like and it's known that he doesn't like? Well, that's drugs for you. And what everyone has said is the only reason these two would have hung out together or been in the same company together would be because of drugs. All right, we are back. Cheers, mates. Want to thank you guys so much for supporting the garage, flying garage ship. Cheers to the people in the back. And I purposely said that this week, Captain, because I got a couple of messages. People said, why do you always give a shout out to the people in the back? And and you and I like to pretend that it's like some kind of live concert. We got people in the back, people on the sides. But in all truthfulness, ah. We've had several people message us over the years that say that I work in a restaurant back of the house and we regularly play true crime garage episodes. So the whole crew can listen to them while we're working. So most of the time when we say cheers to the people in the back, we're talking about the important people in the back of the house. So cheers to all of you out there and thank you for playing the true crime garage podcast. So, so far, in this case, we have Molly, she's 17. We have Colt, he is 21. We have Khan, which is a, a longtime family friend of Molly's. He's 21, but Colt and Khan don't like each other, but for some reason they get into the same car. We suspect it's because they're going to go do some drugs. They're either going to use together or go collect some drugs together. I think what's happened here is that the, that Molly and Colt have probably already been using before they get in the vehicle with Khan. And as you said, they're either going to go use together or they're going to go find more drugs together. Now, our problems really start here, Captain, around 10.30 p.m. And this is when Khan with Colt, and Molly, they stop at a convenience store, a small little store, to pick up some beer for the night, okay? At 10.46 p.m., we have a Wilson police officer. He's actually the captain. His name, Ryan Parsley. I'm the captain. Th that's true. That is very true. Well, this is down in Carter County, Captain. Um, so Ryan Parsley is a police officer for Wilson, for the city of Wilson. He is in a parking lot across the street from this little convenience store that the three stopped at to pick up beer. Uh -huh. Everything should be fine, but no, Khan can't help himself. He sees the police car and he's done something that he's done many times before. He decides, you know what? I'm going to be a real jerk. He pulls up near the police car, starts doing donuts 
which is now spraying the car with gravel. Well, uh, the police don't like when you start doing donuts right in front of them. Newsflash, right? right? They also don't like to have their cruiser being hit by rocks. Damaged by rocks, that's correct. So he pulls off this little stunt, and of course, the police officer flips on his lights, and Khan is now in a police chase, because one thing that Khan does not do is pull over when the police flip on their lights. He has been in multiple police chases leading up to this night. He's super reckless, this dude. This guy is a real pile of shit. Well, and let's also point out that he, as he's fleeing the officer, that night, Khan is driving a borrowed vehicle. It's not even his car. It's a 2012 Honda Accord, Fancy. which during this police chase reached speeds of up to 120 miles per hour. So during the chase, he goes over the county line. He leaves Carter County, goes into Love County, and the county officers there, they joined in the pursuit. But eventually the police lost him. And this was in the vicinity of Long Hollow Road, which is a dead-end road, but it leads to this very large property that's owned by his family, the Nip family. Now, what I want everybody to do is kind of picture, if anybody has seen the the movie Dukes of Hazard or watched the old show The Dukes of Hazard, this is what I pictured every time I was discussing this part of the case with people that were informing me how this went down. Basically, the NIP property, as we said, is very large. It's huge. That's what she said. And on this property, they have a lot of dirt roads, small, narrow roads that have been cleared of trees over the years. So if you look at this property, a satellite picture of this property, you can visually, you can spot all of these trails that run throughout this property. So he, Khan, on several occasions has been involved in activity that leads to a, a police pursuit of him, a police chase of him, so much so that you can hear the officers on the radio saying, it's probably Con Nip in that car, and if it is, he's going to Long Hollow Road. So his M.O. that he does, Captain, is he pisses off the police, he flees them toward his family property, and then goes off-road on these trails that they either can't travel or they have no idea where they're going. Now, you would think that a normal person would realize that, oh, if they know it's me, and this is the same thing I do every time, well, I'll eventually get busted anyway because they can just show up at my door in the morning and knock on the door and and charge me with something the following morning. Well, Khan is not a normal person. He's kind of an asshat, and he thinks he's above the law. I am the law. And he, he, he is also a drug addict. So how much drugs is he on at these times of these police chase i mean who knows the other thing though too is he's he's privileged in the manner that a relative of his is the sheriff of love county and the sheriff on more than one occasion has set up a roadblock to make it very difficult for anyone in his family to get into any kind of trouble with the law now here's the first mystery the first real mystery in our story it's been reported that sheriff joe russell he's the sheriff of love county called off the police chase that night and some have said that it was either due to it just being a very dangerous situation more harm was going to come than good out of this police chase you could have damaged vehicles injured officers Right. 120 mile an hour on roads that are not lit out in the country could even end up in a fatality. So I can agree with that side of the argument 100%. 
The other side of the argument is that he knew that it was one of his relatives, Con Nip, being chased as it wasn't Con's first rodeo and called it off just so one of his own wouldn't get into trouble. I can agree with both of those arguments. So, again, we have Molly, Colt, and Con in this car. There's a police chase. They call off the chase, but we know where Con is going to go. He's going to his family's property. Once he gets on this property, though, the car is going to be dead. Yeah, so what happens here, Captain? We know from eyewitness accounts that Con was driving, Colt was in the front seat, and we have Molly in the back seat of this 2012 Honda Accord. It's 2013, so this is a relatively new vehicle, and he's he's going to drive it off-roading on his family's very large property. And the problem with this police chase is all reports say the same thing. Nobody is certain where the chase ended or when it ended. All we know is that at some point, the county cruisers as well as Wilson PD stopped pursuing the vehicle or the, they, they lost the vehicle in the chase and the vehicle takes on so much damage going through this property. Once it's off road that the vehicle eventually dies. Now, one thing that we also know is that the neighbors, the people that live near this large property, they have large properties as well. But in the past, multiple neighbors had said, you know, we are constantly fixing our fences, our barbed wire fences, because somebody keeps running them over with a vehicle. Well, you don't have to be a Sherlock Holmes to figure out that that's con nip accessing that property in different ways. And the vehicle eventually dies at a location on this very large property. Now, what happens here is a mystery. Now, what we can gather is this. Khan knows this property. He's lived there his entire life. His family have lived there for generations. That's why I say it's like the Dukes of Hazard, right? Anytime they go off-roading to get away from the cops, remember the Roscoe P. Cole train? He doesn't know where the Dukes are going. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and they know those dirt roads like the back of their hand. So the, the law is at a huge disadvantage. And so, unfortunately... Well, in law... <laughs> And the law officers are not on drugs, so they're not going to drive as erratic as somebody that's high on meth. Well, unfortunately, the other people that are at a huge disadvantage once this car dies is Molly and Colt. They don't know their way around this property. This is a huge property. They don't know where they are. They don't know where they need to go. When the car dies... Khan says to y'all, smell you later. You're on your own. And he takes off on foot. Colt and Molly are stuck there near where the vehicle died. And something that I couldn't find, I couldn't get confirmation on. So if there's anybody that's local that could clear this up for me, because I've heard this property is as big as 100 acres, which is pretty big, but could be as large as 1,000 acres. But that's a big difference. Exactly. And I'll offer a little speculation as to why I think there's a discrepancy in, in the reported size of this property. Oftentimes, and this is the, fa the, the case here as well, but oftentimes you get these rural areas where you have a family that's lived there for generations and they have these very large properties. Well, a lot of times their very large property is surrounded by extended family who have very large properties as well. And if in this case, if they all share the same last name, it's very difficult for us as outsiders to determine how much of that property we're talking about. Right. But what we should point out here, Captain, is Colt and Molly are in the, they find themselves in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the night. It's pitch black out there. We're not talking about street lights, right? Us, the city folk, us city folk don't realize how how bright these city lights are, the street lights are, until you get out into a place where there are none. And they have a vehicle that is dead. They have their cell phones. But to be perfectly clear, 
We said they're trapped out in the middle of nowhere. Guess what? If they make it out to the road, which is where they're going to want to go, they're still out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, So this is a crazy predicament that they find themselves in. Now, what we do know happened here is that at 1247 a.m., Molly calls 911. This call lasted five seconds. And in fact, she doesn't say a word during this call. And it's reported that she either hung up or the call was dropped. There's very limited cell service out in this area. The operator tries to, as protocol, tries to return the call and make several calls attempted to Molly's phone, but no one ever picks up. So it's been thought that either she dialed 911 and decided she didn't want to report anything or talk to them and, and purposely hung up. Right. Or that it was an accidental call and the call was dropped. Unfortunately, we do not have Molly to tell us why she called 911 that night. And she didn't, again, no words were said to the emergency personnel when the phone was picked up. Now, Colt's friends have told the media and law enforcement that he called several of them during the early morning hours that night. And he said he was able to give several details as to what was going on. Note, we also have Molly calling people as well, and they're both saying the same thing. We were in a car with Con. It was a police chase. Car breaks down. We are at, we are in the middle of nowhere. We don't know where we are. We don't know how to get to the road and we need help. We need somebody to come out and try to find us. So this point in the timeline, we believe that Molly and Colt are still together, but that, but Khan is nowhere to be found. Yeah. And things are going to get more dire as the night goes along. What happens is at some point, Colt decides that he's going to climb up to the top of this big tree. And he is about 20 to 25 feet in the air, climbed up into this tree because he's trying to see across the land in all directions to see where they should be going. Right. Well, this is where a bad situation gets much worse. He's up in this tree. The branch gives way and breaks. Colt's not a small guy. He's over 200 pounds. The branch breaks. He falls. And in the course of the fall, he breaks his ankle. And we know this because they've relayed this information, they being Molly and Colt, to the friends and people that they're calling to ask to come out and find them. Now we need to be found, but 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 now this guy's leg is broken and it's a bad break. The bone is sticking out. They're asking for people to come out and help find them and bring water with you. Well, some of their friends, um, I it's some of Colt's friends, actually, because keep in mind, these two didn't know each other until about a week or so before this all takes place. Right. So they don't necessarily share all the same friends. One of Colt's friends would later tell police that the call that they got from Colt, he says he's lying in a creek bed with the broken ankle, bone sticking out, and he's coughing up blood. Yeah, Jesus. And he tells his friend, he goes, look, we were in the car with Con. I'm pretty certain that we are somewhere between Long Hollow Road and Pike Road. Right. So a group of his friends drive out there. They're driving up and down these roads, Long Hollow and Pike Roads, honking their horns, flashing the lights, while talking to Colt on the cell phone. This is how large this area is, though, Captain. Colt is telling them, yeah, I I get it. You guys are out here driving, honking the horn, flashing your lights. I can't see any lights. I don't hear any horns. And they're out there basically circling this area. Yeah, and you know, if you're in a very dark area, you're going to be able to see those lights, those headlights from a a good distance. Mm -hmm. But 
th- this is again where I wish we had more clarification on how how many acres this this land is. So, in spite of all these phone calls and people even going out there attempting to find them, Molly and Colt are never located. And then at 9.39 a.m., Molly's phone went dead or was shut off. And this is is a topic for debate right here. Uh Colt Haynes' phone went dead or shut off at 9.57 a.m. July 8th. Now, I get it. Both of them are out there on the phone calling people, asking for help, making a lot of phone calls. As we just said, we know Colt was on the phone for an extended period of time talking to his friends who were driving around circling the area. But it's still suspicious. But it's either very convenient or not happenstance at all that these phones died or were shut off within, what is that, 18 minutes of one another? This is a fucking crazy Her phone story. dies or is shut off at 9.39 a.m. Colt's phone went dead around 9.57 a.m. that same morning and leading up to that that they're never heard from again via phone or any way else as far as where we know after that time period when the phones die so so let me i want to see if i'm picking up what you're putting down mm-hmm. so we have molly she's 17 she's hanging out with colt he's 21 Colt has a drug problem. They're starting a relationship. We think it's possibly more than a friendship. She has a crush on him. They go to this party. There they find Khan, and Khan is going to go, hey, get in my car. We're going to go get drugs or do drugs or something. In this drive, he decides to act like a douchebag and start a high-speed chase we don't know when the cops stopped the chase. Mm-hmm. Did did they go all the way onto the property? Did they end up talking to these individuals? We don't know. But we do know from this communication that Molly and Colt are out. We're assuming it's on Khan's family's land. Yep. And they can't find anybody and they're calling friends and the friends are coming out to look for them. The friends are are flashing their lights. The friends are honking their horns and Molly and Colt don't see anything. Colt gets into a tree. He goes up the tree. He falls out of the tree, possibly breaks his ankle. And then the phones disappear. Like you said, one right after another and they're, and they're just gone. So to, to add a little more, evidence to all of those statements we know that law enforcement were tracking this vehicle in the chase to long hollow road which leads to the nip family property right and we don't know where the chase ended or if they were just simply called off at some point but we know from statements from law enforcement that that's where they were tracking this car too and that's where those statements kind of lead the vehicle to is their property. And then we know from statements from several people that were called by both Colt and Molly that night that Colt had fallen out of a tree, broke his leg, bone sticking out, can't move, can't get up and walk to 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 the road or to safety. Molly's there with him. They don't know where they are. People were out searching for them and they they tell people on the phone about the car chase and the car dying. And I believe that, you know, we, we are on Khan's property, go out to the nip family property. That's where we are. That's where you're going to find us. Please help. That's now. And, and nobody's seen them or heard from them ever again. Never again. Not yeah, Ever again from, from that 9am hour when the phones die they're not seen nor heard from ever again. And l- let's expand this a little bit, our timeline. So on July 22nd, about two weeks, roughly two weeks later, the vehicle in that car chase, the vehicle that died on the property, was found. It's a Honda Accord. 
It was found wrecked in a field near where the police pursuit ended. And it was determined that it had $18,000 worth of damage to it. Jeez. It, it was found abandoned in the woods south of Oswalt Road between Long Hollow Road and Pike Road in Love County. So you have, if you're looking at a map on the west part of that map, you would have Pike Road that runs north and south. And then a little east of that, you're going to have Long Hollow Road. It too runs north and south. Oswalt Road connects the two running east to west. Right. And so this is found in an area, found abandoned in an area south of Oswalt Road, which is directly leads to that very large Nip family property. Now, Here's some added layers to this case. Molly is reported missing by her family to Wilson City, to the city of Wilson, to their police department. Right. They have witnesses saying Molly was in a car with Colt and Con the last time that she was seen. So Wilson PD, they do their jobs and they take the missing person report. Well, Molly's family catches wind of this police chase and all that information and everything they're hearing from everybody. Again, everybody knows everybody in Love County. So Molly's mother calls the Love County Sheriff's Department to report her daughter missing in that county. Why? Because she's saying that she has information coming from all these people that she was, her daughter was in a car with Con in a car chase that ended in Love County. It's, Love County Sheriff's Department's jurisdiction at this point, where she went missing from, where she was last seen and heard from. Molly's mother is told by Sheriff Joe Russell that he will not take the missing persons report, that this is not his problem. This is Wilson PD's problem and Carter County's problem. I have an issue just with that wording anyways. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want her to call another county there's there's a professional way to do that you're paid to protect and serve and this this kind of action this kind of language this kind of um immature behavior is what's going to cause a bunch of questions to start coming towards law enforcement in this case you have two young adults that went missing and they were with this pile of shit of a person that is connected back to law enforcement. Exactly. And here's here's the other problem. So Colt Haynes is an adult. There's nobody filing a report for him, or if they are, it's it's the same old, same old. He's an adult. He's allowed to not come home situation. Molly Miller is where you have the opportunity to raise the flag, raise the alarm. Right. And say, this is a child. This is a minor. She went missing. Yeah, maybe she was up to some questionable questionable behavior, but nobody deserves to disappear. And you have Love County Sheriff, who's supposed to be protecting and serving people in his county, saying, look, not my problem. And so the Molly Miller situation, which should have led to an investigation immediately, was actually treated like a runaway situation. And where she went missing from, the sheriff there is on record saying, not my problem. Make sure you join us back here in the garage, same bat time, same bat channel. And until then, be good, be kind, and don't live.